If you think you know what the crown is in relation to the way our country is run, you might want to think again and read one of the few books written about our constitution. Two of our most learned minds on the topic have collaborated to put together the book This Realm of New Zealand, The Sovereign, The Governor-General and The Crown. Professor Janet McLean is a professor of law at Auckland University and she worked with Dame Alison Quentin Baxter, who's a distinguished public and international lawyer. The book explores exactly how our democratic constitutional monarchy works and what role individuals play. To explain the complexities further, we spoke to Janet McLean. Welcome to the programme. Thank you. This is quite the comprehensive book. Uh, We hope so. (laughs) I don't want to write it again. No. Well, I mean, it's one of those things that that you could have to write again, though, at sort of not any given moment, but any sort of change to our constitutional arrangement would mean you would have to write it again. Well, that's exactly right. And one of the things that we were trying to do in the book was to try and describe how the Queen and the Governor-General and the Crown worked in our present constitution with a view to if this is looked at in the future in the Republican debate, people would see what needed to change or what might need to be looked at again. Taking it right back to the beginning, do you think people understand what our constitutional arrangements are? I really think they don't. I I teach at university. Students come in knowing more about the US constitution than they do about our own, I would say informed by television and so on. So, yeah, there's a real need to inform this debate. And we are very much influenced by the fact that in the Australian debates about republicanism, people didn't really know what role the Queen performed in the present constitution. Mm. So we want to inform that debate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I thought I was pretty knowledgeable. I thought I was, I was you know up with the play and there's a lot in this that I didn't know. Um, I think one of the things I found really interesting was the the, the sort of varying definitions of the crown and what we mean when we talk about the crown. I think that's the most difficult thing in this whole thing. Yeah, If you think about the way we talk about the crown and the relationship to the Treaty of the Waitangi, we almost always refer to the Crown when something's gone wrong, which is quite interesting because governments of the day don't want to say it's the government, they say it's the Crown. So we use it as this idea of the New Zealand state in perpetuity quite often. Mm. And we personify the New Zealand state in perpetuity as well, which is quite interesting. I think. Yeah, so, so, so there's, the, there's the idea of the sort of the, the corporation of New Zealand yeah. that is the crown. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and who signs agreements on our behalf and, and what that means. Completely thrown, of course, by the fact that there's a Netflix show literally called The Crown about the Queen. Um, <laughs> Which I haven't seen. It was too much like hard work. I, see, I was <laughs> interestingly watching it as I was reading this book. Uh, and it was both useful and not useful at the same right, time. Right. Uh, I, I, I think, yeah, the, this idea that because we talk about certainly the Treaty of Waitangi, for example, yeah. is signed by the Crown yeah. and therefore what that means. Yeah, and and it's not just signed by the Crown, but signed by on behalf of Queen Victoria in 1840. And now we have a different Crown, which is the Queen and Right of New Zealand, who is actually a different office informed by New Zealand ministers, New Zealand elected officials, mm. not by the British as it was in 1840. So there's that big constitutional change that underlines the difficulties about working out who's the crown as well. Yeah. I think there was, there's, there's one story in there that I, that I really like talking about this stuff, about the fact that whether or not the king could treat whales as a royal fish. <laughs> I really loved this. Oh, look, it takes you into the arcane. <laughs> yeah, it really but, does. And, they, and the king can in Britain, but not in New Zealand. There we are. <laughs> Because, because essentially of the Treaty of Waitangi. Yeah, and because of Aboriginal title. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that's independent it's, of the treaty as well. So customary Aboriginal title would allow Maori rights over Wales. So anyone who's out there on the water at the moment on holiday, they're not the queens. They're not the queens, no. And no. in the way that is it, swans are the queens in, oh, in the UK. I Something so. like I that. I, I don't know definitively, but in <laughs> terms of popular culture, yes, apparently. yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. One of the things that's often talked about with the New Zealand Constitution is that we don't have a constitution because yeah. uh, so much of it is not written down, and so much of it is not written down in 
law that has been written in New Zealand, we don't have a constitution. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, it's a really big question, that. Our law is now written in New Zealand, and that's a big change since, and that's been happening gradually since 1840. That's one of the things that we're trying to say in this book, that our law is now written here. Up um, to as late as sort of, I think... It, like 86, The, the, the yeah. 1980s, which yeah, I was exactly, astonished by. Exactly, so it was very late, uh, and that's a story in itself. Why were we so late to embrace that? It's not written in one place, and it is... The most important things in our constitution are probably conventional rather than rules of law. And I think that's very interesting, and we tried to capture that. So a lot of things, for example, are done in the Queen's name, but she always follows the advice of her responsible ministers, that is, the government of the day. And so the, 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 this idea of, of constitutional conventions, yeah. which some people argue are, are, are positive because yeah. uh, they give us flexibility. They're actually probably more held to than, than actual constitutional law, than, than codified constitutional law. So it's, but on the other hand, you have to be very careful that people actually follow the convention. Absolutely. And the civil service has a role in that. The public service have a role and the major officers, such as the Solicitor General, the Clerk of the House, they all a part of that. So there's a numerous high officials that will help keep those constitutional conventions in play. But also, there are statements now of convention which are a really good guide. So the Cabinet Manual is a really good guide to the expectations that all parties should have around changes of government, around appointments of the Governor General, and so on. So we've done quite a lot of work in New Zealand. In fact, the UK has copied us in this respect in trying to get down on writing what some of these crucial understandings are. Can you give me an example? What are some of those crucial understandings? So what's an example of, of one? Well, here's the most, the, the most striking. Um, one of my colleagues calls this the simple, beautiful rule of the British Constitution, but it also applies in New Zealand. That is that if a government loses confidence of the House, then you have to resign and you go to an election or you go, the other parties are, are allowed a chance to form a government. Now, you know, some people in the US would love that right now, right? So they, they have to go between elections. There's no way of pulling the plug on it halfway through. So in our system, you're only in power so long as you have the confidence of the House of Parliament. That's a conventional rule, but it's always follow. One of the one of the things that I found really interesting, and I mentioned that, that I've been watching The Crown and I, and I do love it, uh, the show, what would happen on the death of Her Majesty and, and how kind of much more complicated that is than we might think. Well, that's really interesting. And one of the things that we had the benefit of in writing this book was access to the files of the last time a monarch died. And so we saw what procedures were put in place. And not all of what we found actually made it to the book, but we certainly have assembled that guidance for next time. I mean, it certainly will be a bit less complicated now that there's modern communications. Yeah. But yeah, there's all sorts of protocols. But one of the things that the Constitution does is it's seamless. There will be a sovereign, there is always a sovereign, uh, and there's never a gap in power. Mm. The Queen is dead, long live the Yeah, the, exactly. The king. And including Regency, which has been discussed a little bit in Britain, uh, I think, too. And we have arrangements for uh, a regent as well in our Constitution Act in New Zealand. So what I found quite interesting was that if the, the monarch is incapacitated in some way and they haven't appointed a regent, there's some kind of administrative council that can yeah. take over some of her roles. Yeah. But the one thing that, or one of the things that that council can't do is replace the monarch. Exactly. So couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't they couldn't f fire the queen. They couldn't suddenly become a republic. But also, no. from our perspective in New Zealand, they couldn't do anything to the governor general. No, no. Uh, and the minister, uh, the appointment of the governor general is by the monarch by way of the advice of New Zealand ministers. So it's still New Zealand ministers who are in charge of who gets to be the governor general here. Because this is the thing that's going to happen, you know with all of the best wishes to the Queen uh, at some point soon. Yeah. She's not a young woman. Is it something that the government 
would be preparing for? Is it a thing that, that, that people would be thinking about now? What happens to our constitution and to our, to our constitutional framework when the monarch is replaced? Well, there's the immediate things that would have to happen. So I'm sure that partly our book is trying to inform that. So there'd have to be changes to the Royal Titles Act and so on. And I'm, I'm sure the government's aware of that. I think one of the reasons we wrote this book is that we think there might be more deeper questions asked about the future at that point as well. I don't get a, a strong sense of that coming out of government at the moment, but they keep an eye on all of this. Mm. Yeah, I guess the, the bigger questions, the deeper questions that might be asked if then, or at, really at any point, is, is whether or not New Zealand should remain a constitutional monarchy or whether we should become a republic. I did some discussions about this on Queen's birthday last year, uh-huh. and... I I don't know. I'm not convinced of either argument, and and sort of. But what you sort of talk about in the book is that it's it's more complicated than just deciding we have another head of state. Yes. Now we don't want to be saying you know we're trying to be neutral if anyone can be. Yeah. So we're not trying to say it's impossible. We're trying to think about what questions we should be asking. And I I met with someone from Australia who'd been asked this question in a government lawyer's capacity in Australia, and she said, and I think she's right, that 90% of it would be easy and 10% of it would be really hard. So the first question is, do we want to keep a non-partisan head of state, which is what we've got at the moment? Mm -hmm. I mean, we could have the Prime Minister being the head of state as well. We could go for a more presidential. We, you know, prime ministers have become more presidential in the last few cycles of elections. It's a worldwide phenomenon. They could be the head of state. We'd have to change quite a lot of things if we did that. Some people might say that there's an advantage of having a politically neutral or non-partisan head of state who represents not just the government but the sort of nation as a whole, the community some representative of of all of that, and also might also have some role as an intermediary between the citizen and the state. Uh, Someone you petition, you know, we petition the Governor-General now, the Queen, and for pardons, for example. So, So, you know, would we want to try and replicate something close to what we've got now where we have a personification of the state which is non-partisan, sort of neutral? Uh, And if we did that... How would we select that person without making them partisan? Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big. That's a question. <laughs> that, I mean, that's a very big question. I think. Yeah. I mean, so so, what are some of the other sort of you know ten percent of things that that would be really difficult? That I guess, you know, I like the idea. I, mean, I shouldn't say that. Be very careful about saying that. I guess once you sort of have decided who the head of state is, does everything else flow from there? Not, not well, not not no, completely. You no. can't. I mean, we've got this very odd constitution, where everything used to flow from the king or queen, mm. and probably if you were doing that again, even if you were trying to just replicate who the queen was with a nominated or elected figure, you probably wouldn't want the queen doing everything. I mean, at the moment, the queen grants fee simple title to land. I mean, you know, you wouldn't want the governor general or whatever whoever mm. it was that replaced them to do that. So we. We would have, to, I think, we we would have to rethink our whole system of land title. Now that's a job for the lawyers, but it's not an uncomplicated job, no. right? And not an unpolitical job in New Zealand. Yeah. I wouldn't have said. So there's those issues. I think there are very politically sensitive issues around the Treaty of Waitangi. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, I mean that's a really big question here, and any sense in which the Crown's obligations were being diminished by a move for, to a republic would be resisted, mm-hmm. to say the least. And I also think that there's quite a difficult question about how much say you would expect from Māori as a group to move to a republic. I think there's that question about the consent, which would have to be dealt with quite delicately. We've got some suggestions in the book about what you might do mm. there. The thing that really struck me looking at the history of Crown Maori relationships is how many promises were made by the Crown, how these promises became became quite personal. So we have the Kingi Tawangi movement sending envoys to London to meet with 
queens and kings. We have the Ratana movement meeting with kings and queens. We've got this personal relationship with the sovereign. We've got the queen signing the Waikato Tainui settlement. There's something personal going on there. And I don't know how we would continue to capture that. Mm. I think that's quite a big challenge in a way that keeps keeps the constitutional show on the road, if you like, you know, keeps the gains that we've made in, in, in that area. I mean, I guess the, the, the interesting thing about the Constitution, I'm mean, just thinking about that, that everything has flowed from, you know, if you look back, everything flowed from the king. Yeah. Uh, that, that actually, if you look at British history and then latterly New Zealand history, it has been a sort of constant move of devolving power away from the king yeah. to, I guess, for us, the New Zealand government. Yes. Uh, for, for in Britain, I guess, parliament. I guess for us, it's parliament as well, technically as well. And so, realistically, in some ways, a republic is the next kind of logical step. Yeah, I mean, it is and it isn't. In a way, we've democratised the king. So that's why we have a constitutional monarchy. It's the elected officials who who decide, and we have a symbol. That symbol probably does a little bit more work than we think, Mm -hmm. uh, but we could find another symbol that could do that. We'd have to... I mean, building a new symbol is going to be harder than borrowing and (laughs) modifying an old symbol, but it's not, not undoable. Maybe the Republic is the next step. So, but... You know, as I say, who's got a crystal ball? I mean, maybe people don't want more change and a republicanism isn't looking so good around the world at the moment. Um, And there doesn't seem to have been a lot of appetite for it in New Zealand. Well, you know, it's hard for me to judge. I mean, I've because I've been working on this book for some time, I've met quite a few people in the Republican movement who are really very keen and think that this is, that being tied to the British apron strings in any way is anathema and that we should you know, really have our own, run our own show. And I, I understand those arguments. I have some sympathy for them. On the other hand, you know, there's, there's some nuances that we might lose if we're not careful. That's really my message. Yeah. One of the other arguments, uh, one of the other the sort of, I guess, spanners in the works is actually what happens to the New Zealand realm. I think we forget often that we have a realm. It's quite something, isn't it? So there are 16 realms of which the Queen is sovereign. And I better get this right. In our realm, we have the Ross Dependency, uh, that not very well known and not very populated part of Antarctica. Uh, we have Tokelau. Nui, uh, the Cooks, and New Zealand. Now, of course, being all part of the realm doesn't affect the political arrangements in those uh, different parts. We've, but the Crown's a symbol of free association between those different territories. And we suggest in the book, you know, if we were to think about a republic, then we really must remember that it's up to those different places to decide their own future, that New Zealand doesn't decide for all of the territories in the realm. And also that we might want to concretise some of that link, historic link going forward, in thinking about citizenship and so on, those sort of questions uh, that we've shared historically. It's a question that certainly when I asked Republicans at about, about no one quite knew <laughs> what the answer to, to, to that was. I will keep asking that question. Well, that's partly what our book's here for. Yeah, you know, absolutely. These are things that people don't know. I'm, my co-author, I have to say, Dame Alison Quentin Baxter, she wrote the Letters Patent in 1983 for the um, government. She, she's, she's probably the only person who really understands some <laughs> of these things. You should probably explain what the Letters Patent are. Okay, so the Letters Patent... Uh, it's a uh, very fancy sounding thing. Oh, very fancy and very quite arcane. Nominally written by the Queen, and they set out what the Governor General's role is here. So they, they give authority, they convey executive authority to New Zealand. They're the source of government authority, actually. Mm. So, you know, this is a, a step in, the, in our constitution, completely hidden from view. Very hard to get hold of them, even on the I, internet. I was going to ask, are, like, are they actually a physical letter? Can like, can you go and see them somewhere? They must exist somewhere. I haven't seen the originals. Yeah, let's hope someone's got them. Yeah. 
be like the 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 US Constitution going missing. <laughs> <laughs> what one of the other things I found I found fascinating, and and again I'm going to come back to the Netflix show The Crown, is the tremendous importance of the role of of the monarch's private secretary. Yes, that's really interesting. And one of the things that I was really struck with, because I'm not a royal watcher myself, is how much the monarch has has mon- has modernised her role. I mean, it's really striking. We hadn't had a monarch visit New Zealand until Queen Elizabeth II. And then we've had something close to 60 visits? Something, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And then the younger Not royals... Not just from have, the Queen, obviously. Yeah, and then the younger, and the younger royals have, have taken up the reins more mm. recently. And I think that does show a real interest and in wanting to know about her different realms. And I'm, I've met with the private secretary and, and very, very interested in New Zealand and, and very well informed about New Zealand. It was quite striking, very well informed. And they I have think. New Zealand people and Australian people and Canadian people in their, in their, in their offices, offices now yes. so as to keep exactly. them informed. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, you know, when the... A royals visit, they give speeches, but you know those speeches will have been the New Zealand government will know what the content of those speeches are and so on. So they're very, very interested and very, very knowledgeable about this part of the world. Do you feel safe with all of the work that you've done? Do you feel confident that uh, that that our constitutional arrangements are are robust? I think it's the job of a constitutional lawyer to always feel unsafe. In the sense that we've got to keep vigilant. And I think there's a couple of things that I think are really, two or three things that are, are, are really worrying for all constitutions. I think one is the level of public engagement with the constitution. I think it's worse where it's an unwritten constitution because people don't can't point to something that does summarise what a constitution stands for. So I think that's a reason to keep vigilant. I think that one of the other reasons why we need to keep vigilant is that a lot of constitutions, including the US Constitution, only survive because people think, oh, we've got to do something for the long term because if we do this, then the next people will do something else. So I think that, for example, the US Constitution might be very protective of some things, but it's not very protective of the unwritten constitution about just doing things the right way and appointing officials and firing officials and so on. And and we've got the same issues here, but actually I think our unconstitution, our unwritten conventions are stronger perhaps than the US that has a, a written constitution. So mm. I think that's a reason to be vigilant. I think, you know, we are in an era of post-truth, and I think that really does require us to be all to be vigilant and unless we have clear expectations of political leaders and some of those expectations need to be enforced by several different people. You know, one of the things that I'm worried about in terms of our our constitution is that we we sometimes talk about the Governor-General as the guardian of our constitution who might refuse to assent to a bill if it was unconstitutional or might sort of hold back the tide of tyranny. Um, And I think that's a bit overstated, and I think anyway, in terms of what we have, but also I think for, for, for anyone to hold back the tide of unconstitutionality, you need lots of different institutions that do that. Different officials, uh, perhaps some role to the courts, not always the final role, but perhaps some role in some cases. So I think that, yeah, as I say, as a constitutional lawyer, I think we all need to be vigilant all the time. Uh, someone said to me that the the greatest danger to a constitution is to have a good leader. Because a good leader, a good prime minister, will be given greater powers that will be inherited by the bad leader who comes along later. So you know, these are the, the problems for constitutions. They're written for the long term. They're written for the good and the bad. And they're written for the future, not just where we're, where we're at now. That's a perfect place to end. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.